So good afternoon, everyone joining us from Morocco, and good morning to those of you joining from the US, mainly our panelists and some of our attendees. Um, I'm Mariam Hamam, the Community Engagement Officer at Masisi, the Moroccan American Commission for Educational and Cultural Exchange. So as some of you may know, we are currently celebrating 40 uh, years of the Commission, and we have started a webinar series. So this is going to be the fourth installment in this webinar series for the anniversary. Um, and we will be discussing the new era of Moroccan diplomacy. Um, I am joined by Dr. Uh, Kelly Brzeet and Dr. Matthew Bueller, who will be our presenters for the webinar, and our moderator, Dr. Kerry Barnett. So I will be yielding the floor to Carolyn Barnett. If you could please present yourself and then introduce our speakers as well. Thank you, Maryam, um, and congratulations to Masisi on the 40th anniversary. That's really great. Thank you um, I'll just briefly introduce myself. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the School of Government and Public Policy and the School of Middle Eastern and North African Studies at the University of Arizona. Um, I'm also a Fulbright alumna, so I spent uh, 2018 to 2019 in Morocco, um, mostly in Rabat, um, as a Fulbright grantee working on my uh, doctoral research. So, um, you know, it's great to see, to be involved with stuff Masisi is running uh, in an ongoing way. Um, so I'm really happy to be here today. Um, so I'm first going to introduce um, Dr. Bjit, um, and he'll uh, give his remarks, and then I'll introduce Dr. Bueller um, just before he gives his remarks um, separately. Uh, so Dr. Karim Bjit is currently conducting his Fulbright postdoctoral research at Morgan State University in Baltimore. Uh, he's a professor of English and American Studies at Abdel Malik Saad University in Tetuan, and he's coordinator of the doctoral program uh, New Trends in Linguistic, Literary, and Cultural Studies. Previously, he taught English and American literatures for 16 years at the University of Hassan II in Casablanca uh, and chaired the Moroccan American Studies Research Laboratory from 2013 to 2016. Um, he was also a research fellow at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study in the summer of 2007 um, and a postdoc Fulbright scholar in the summer of 2011 uh, based in San Diego State University in California. Um, so welcome, uh, Dr. Bajit. And um, I'll pass over the mic to you um, to share your initial remarks. Well, thank you. I am very pleased and honored to be part of this webinar. And I'd like to thank the Fulbright director and staff for making this happen. Well, I want to begin by saying that uh, as a Moroccan who lived into Paris, um, the era of the late King Hassan II, and uh, the present era, which started from 2000, I have seen a, a tremendous uh, change, a positive one in, in most of, you know, most of the time, uh, in political, social, and economic conditions. The Morocco I experienced in, in the 1980s as, as a teenager, uh, as a student in the 1990s, was one weighed down with a heavy legacy of uh, repression, um, poverty, and economic hardships. But uh, over the last two decades, I have observed with a lot of appreciations, like many Moroccans of my generation, uh, a huge uh, improvements and reforms in relation to human rights conditions, individual freedoms, empowerment of women, fighting religious extremism, reforming public administration, reducing disparities between rural and urban regions, uh, uh, improving the services and attracting foreign investment. I look at various data from 2002 to 2021, drawn from reliable uh, sources, international sources, and I see significant growth in GDP, employment, life expectancy, literacy, particularly among girls, uh, access to water and electricity, uh, internet and public services. I also see uh, impressive decrease in infant mortality. Let me give you just a, a simple example. We moved down from 38 per thousand births in 2002 to 16.8 uh, in 2021. And that's still high when you, when you compare it with, with the European rates below five. Still uh, much to, uh, work to do. I also see a uh, reduction in gender inequalities. I see less poverty, I see less crime. Um, but I have to be fair, this is a checkered record when it comes to other indicators, such as healthcare expenditure, quality education, 
access to job market, this housing, so taxation, access to justice, work environment, freedom of speech. There's a long way to go to create this um, uh, open, democratic, uh, and accountable um, government. Um, so uh, if we, uh, there is a way to measure progress, actually. It's, it's in the in the geopolitical position that Morocco has today uh, in the Arab, Mediterranean, and, and African regions. Morocco has braved its way through the years of economic crisis, the long years of structural adjustment under the austere eyes of the World Bank, um, the transition from dictatorship to relatively open society has been fairly smooth. Uh, it breeded new optimism and determination to confront the chronic and, and, and uh, structural uh, problems. Um, so I would, you know, I, I don't want to take long. I mean, this is just a, a general idea of, you know, how I see things, how I see Morocco today, that it has uh, moved from one obscure and dark uh, era into something much more reassuring and, and uh, cheerful than before. Um, it, how, how much time do I have? I can, I can go on, but I, I don't want to take too much time. I want to then make this Yeah, you could speak for another minute or two if you'd like, but if you well, prefer um, to do it, that's also fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the new era of, of globalization, social media, terrorism, Morocco seems to be recouped quite well. Uh, it had weathered the storms of the Arab Spring 2011, of course, and the effects of COVID 19 and has overall emerged um, stronger and, and more united. The 2011 constitution in particular has opened a new prospect for expanding freedoms, holding government to public account. But we observe today a new figure uh, in, in social media, um, in, in the public protests. And I think all of these are not signs of crisis, but healthy uh, indication of, uh, uh, of a dynamic and vibrant civil society. Not on the economic level, and also in, in foreign policy, and I think that's the the, the topic of, of today. And so I uh, I will have time to come back to these issues later. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much for those opening remarks. Um, we'll turn now to Dr. Matthew Bueller. Um, Dr. Bueller is an associate professor of political science at the University of Tennessee, and he's also a global security fellow at the Howard H. Baker Jr. Center for Public Policy. Um, he's a specialist of comparative politics and international relations in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, he's been traveling regularly to the Arab world since 2006, completing over three years of fieldwork and Arabic training in North Africa, Syria, and the Persian Gulf. Um, and uh, it's not in the bio I was given, but he has an excellent book uh, about politics in Morocco that you should all read. Um, so I'll hand it over to Dr. Bueller now. Thank you, Carrie. That's very, very nice of you. I don't know if it's excellent. I want you guys to read it and you can write me an email and tell me if it's excellent or not. It's on Amazon. You can find it, Walmart. There are lots of different sources. <laughs> But today I'm going, well, thank you, Masisi, for inviting me. I've never been a Fulbright scholar at Masisi, but I spent a lot of time in Morocco over the years. I've been coming back and forth since 2009. Uh, and I, I knew Jim thank Miller very, very well. Thank you for joining. Pardon me, Miriam? Thank you for joining us. So, uh, so anyway, today I'm going to talk to you all about uh, my second book, which is coming now, uh, that I'm currently working on. And I think I'm going to, if I can, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if that's, if that's uh, possible. Can you guys see that okay? Let me, hold on a second. Uh, let's see, how do I do this? Oh, share screen. Okay, here, hold on. Can you guys see this okay now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you about this book that I'm beginning to do research on and write that's called Shrunken Empire, the Politics of the U.S.-Morocco Alliance. So this is based on mostly on archival research that I've done in the United States in the presidential uh, archives of the Kennedy, Johnson, and Eisenhower administrations, some declassified documents, as well as some work in Moroccan uh, archives with like the Al-Alam newspaper, as well as some archives at the Talim Center in, in Tangier. 
So uh, this book is still in its early phases. I'm still collecting information and evidence, and I'm looking forward to your feedback on it. So the basic question of the book is, under what conditions does cooperation between the United States and Morocco become uh, more or less successful? Before addressing this question, we need to go over some basic background, kind of the backdrop to the relation between these two countries. And a good way to understand this is to look at the, the doctoral dissertation that Mohamed Assad wrote in 1993, uh, which eventually became a book, a well-regarded book published in 1994, in which he describes Morocco during the 20th century as being literally carved up uh, by multiple different European powers. And if we look at the, the map of Morocco during the colonial per period, uh, this is really true. <clears throat> so of course, everyone knows Morocco is divided by two different colonial powers, France and Spain. The French zones were liberated in March, 1956. Uh, Spain occupied the North and, and the most of South of Morocco. Uh, most of the North was liberated in 1956. Tarfaya was liberated uh, in 1958. Sidi Ifni was liberated in 1969. And the Moroccan Sahara was liberated after the Green March in 1975. Tanger, uh, Morocco's second largest city, was an international zone, but ruled by eight different countries. And it maintained its international status until 1960. So it's to put that in the context for Americans so they can understand, it's like if you have New York and Los Angeles, and Los Angeles was ruled by eight different countries, foreign countries, for 40 years. I mean, it's really kind of a big deal. Uh, so really, I think the King's, uh, his dissertation really hit the point home that Morocco had been divided by all these different European powers that had a stake in Morocco's future. Uh, of course, when you talk to many Moroccans, uh, the status of, of Septa and Malila, really they have never been liberated uh, and they continue to be occupied uh, by Spanish forces. So even if you look at the newspapers from this time period, 1962 here, this is a newspaper called the Istiklal, which preceded Al Alam, published by uh, the, the Independence Party. Um, and it discusses the status of Septa and Malila saying, you know, uh, lastly, there are the territories occupied by, by Spanish troops, cities like Septa and Melilla, which have been transformed by Madrid into veritable fortresses, have become absences dangerous to our national security. So this is really something uh, that continues even today. So this is a, a statement released by uh, Mustafa al-Khalfi, who was the former Minister of Communications under the Ben Kiran government, also a former Fulbright scholar to the United States and a good friend of mine. Uh, making a similar argument that Septa and Malila has, have still remained to be liberated and reunited with Morocco. So uh, during the pre-colonial period, the territories of Morocco extended much farther than we might envision them today. Uh, this is the, the, the map of the colonial of, of Morocco pre, during the pre-colonial period, during the, uh, the first, the, the, the original Alawite empires uh, that goes obviously way beyond down to Shingeti and Mauritania uh, in, into Mali as well. If we take those current bo borders and superimpose them on the contemporary map today, this is kind of what it would look like. Uh, so you can get a sense of how those territories relate till today. So what this really symbolizes uh, is that within many Moroccans, there, deep down, there's this kind of sense that the contemporary borders, contemporary territories of Morocco do not necessarily match with what Morocco has historically been, right? During the original pre-colonial empire. And so in terms of returning back to our research question, under what conditions does cooperation between the US and Morocco become more or less successful? The book basically examines, or basically argues, the kind of preliminary argument is that this is very much related to the role of the United States playing in helping or not helping sometimes Morocco in terms of achieving this sovereignty and unity uh, that it, it has to historically lack and it's constantly kind of working towards, okay? So, um, and the answer you might think is a little bit more complicated th than we might think. Uh, basically, the United States has, has really played three different roles uh, in terms of this. In some ways, uh, the United States has had a positive role and helped Morocco in terms of, of achieving its territorial aims and sovereignty. Sometimes it's been neutral and has basically done nothing. Uh, and third, sometimes it has actively opposed it and has been in some ways more of the problem and less of the solution. So some of the positive uh, examples we all know, they're very famous uh, kind of like in the history of Moroccan American relations, the, ro the role of Franklin Roosevelt in 1943 in advocating for the Sultan's rule against, uh, against Churchill and de Gaulle. Uh, the US official recognition of the Moroccan sovereignty over the Moroccan Sahara in 2020, of course, was a very big deal. 
the African lion exercises in Tantan between 2000 and the contemporary period today, which helped Moroccan forces train to be able to prepare if they have to deal with any kind of external threat from another state. Uh, and US Moroccan efforts to contain Iran, Iran has played a divisive role in Moroccan uh, politics as well, has tried to foment various uh, acts of, uh, against uh, territorial integrity within the country. And so all these are different examples, positive examples where, Morocco, where the United States has had a very strong role in helping Morocco uh, deal with these situations. But uh, in terms of dealing with Mauritania, for example, there's an article from the Istiklal newspaper. Now this was published in English. I have uh, copies of this in Arabic and French, of course, but I'm showing everyone the English version because we don't know if there are Americans watching this as well, who may not speak uh, or may not read either French or Arabic. But here uh, is Istiklal newspaper 1962 talking about Mauritanian status. So saying Mauritania too is always on our people's thoughts. That part of Morocco must be reintegrated in the coming months unless we want our supporters there to conclude that they have been abandoned by their mother country. So in 1960, uh, 19, 1962, King Hassan Du met with the French or the American ambassador Bonsal and had kind of a conversation with Kennedy via the ambassador asking whether the United States would support Morocco on this position. His basic logic being that, you know, Mauritania is a very small country, only 600,000 people at the time, very, very large territorial scope. Uh, and that many people in Mauritania had historical links to Morocco, that many people there embraced uh, Mohamed al-Khamis as being commander of the faithful, just like in Morocco. And so that the, the Sultan or the king at that time could provide a, a degree of stability that was in both Morocco's interests and in, in, in American interests. But President Kennedy politely considered, uh, considered this request and basically said, I don't wanna do anything. I don't wanna get involved. I'm gonna remain neutral on this. And this is from a, a declassified document from the, the Kennedy um, Library in Boston. So, and also, and this is hard for Americans to hear, but sometimes the United States has played a negative role, that the United States has been part of the problem more than part of the solution in, in order, in terms of helping Morocco in turn uh, achieve its territorial unity and its territorial sovereignty. So the successor to Roosevelt, Harry Truman in 1951, signed a secret agreement with, with the, French, the French colonial powers at the time in order to take over five bases within Morocco. This was not consulted with the Sultan at all. It was something that was done directly with the French. And today the, the airport known, known as Mohamed al Khamis Airport was what was known as Nwasser Air Base, which was the largest US American uh, airfield outside of the United States and secretly hosted nuclear weapons that were used as a deterrent against the Soviet Union. The U.S. naval base of Conetra existed from 1951 until 1980. The Voice of America relay station, which was basically used to, to emit anti-Soviet uh, messages and radio stations and radio programs and such, uh, at, was active uh, from 1949 without the permission of the Moroccan government until 2007. And then there was also finally a group of American expatriates living in Tanger who called themselves the American colony, <clears throat> which I'll get into that a little bit more. So just to go a little bit more into this, uh, the, the discussion about the US bases here, for example, the reaction uh, from what became one of the factions of the Istiklal party was that uh, you know the PDI was the first political party to present to the United States delegation at the UN in 1951, a note on the question, neither America nor France had the right to construct bases without approval of the Sultan. For, is, for us, it was a matter of national honor. These bases should not have been built without approval, without authorization, and without the Moroccans being able to demand some legitimate compensation for their presence within the country. So ordinary Moroccans also realized that the United States did not always have a positive role. So this was in 1954, there was a grenade attack against a group of American uh, soldiers holding a cocktail party at the Belima Hotel, which today many people know is where people uh, sell magazines and books out in front of the parliament for bot. Uh, in terms of there's a variety of riots in 1955, which, um, which were targeted mostly at French and, and Spanish troops, but also uh, the Americans were very con concerned about this. There were stones that were thrown at American Air Force buses, for example, uh, and very clear instructions came from the generals of the American Air Base to basically said it is forbidden for American personnel to discuss local politics or religion or to enter the Medinas or other native quarters. So suggesting that even the Moroccans, you know, recognize that the U.S. troops, right, were part of the Western presence within Morocco. And in 1958, in the, uh, the, the throne day speech, Mohamed al Khamis demanded the, the, the evacuation of all foreign troops uh, within Morocco two years after, after independence. 
And he was really implying there not only Spanish and French troops, but also our troops. And that's something that Americans need to you know, come to terms with over time. And kind of the, the, the apex of this was an, an incident in which a US Air Force uh, captain was slain who was coming out of Nawasa Air, Air, Airfield. The, the incident around it, the, the facts are still a little bit murky, but basically he pulled up with his wife and another, uh, another female American and was shot uh, from two different directions in the car from the front and from the back. And then the car was subsequently pelted with stones uh, in, in after the event, the explanation was that there had been like a case of mistaken identity in which this American uh, officer was was thought to be a kidnapper, a Moroccan kidnapper or something, and that these people had done this were actually Moroccan police by accident. Uh, I think that the evidence suggests, especially like if this was a police incident, then why were stones thrown afterwards? It's something factually doesn't really make a whole lot of sense there. But whether or not whether it was something intentional, like an assassination from nationalists or if it really was an accident, this obviously created a lot of tensions between the local American servicemen living in, in the Casablanca area at the time and the Moroc Moroccan population. So finally, the status of Tanger at the time. So the American colony in Tanger was a group uh, of American expatriates, including like Malcolm Forbes, for example, uh, the founder of Forbes magazine, billionaires, who lived in, in Tanger because they had a special tax exempt status. And this basically allowed them to not pay taxes in Morocco or in the United States and to live there, uh, you know, for free. And this was came under attack by uh, Abdurrahman Abu Abid, who became like a chief, one of the chief proponents of democratization in the 1980s and 1990s with the USFP, the Ittihad al-Ishiraki. Uh, and he basically said, hey, we're, your Americans are welcome to live in Tanger, you're welcome here, but we think you should be paying taxes uh, like everyone else. So I think, you know, in conclusion, I hope people don't misinterpret my presentation for being, especially the second half for being a little bit negative. That's not at all what I mean. I mean, the, the relations between these two great countries are, are very complicated. You know, some of the people in the audience might be married. You know, great marriages, they have their ups and their downs. They have their victories and their triumphs. And that's very much like the relationship between the United States, right? That is, has its ups and downs. You know, 80% of the interactions have been very positive, very helpful. Uh, but there have also been some that have been not so positive. And I think uh, as, a, as, a, as a people, the, the Americans really more than even more than Moroccans need to come to the recognition uh, that, that the relationship between these two great countries can't be simply reduced to the story between George Washington and the Sultan. In fact, you know, that's a great story. El Maghreb Aziz Alayi. I love this story because Moroccans know it. It's a positive story. But the reality is with two countries so as important as these two, the relationship is often more complicated. And that's something that we need to come to terms with and, and exam, examine more. So thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions. Great. Um, thank you so much uh, for that really interesting presentation. I'm really looking forward to the book. Um, if you wouldn't mind just uh, stopping your screen sharing, and then I think we can all see each other a little better. Um, great. Um, so as moderator, I'm going to start by asking a few questions myself, and then we'll open it up to questions from our audience members. Um, so the first, which either one of you uh, should feel free to take on first, is, um, you know, I think as, as Americans and Moroccans in the context of, um, you know, Masisi and the, that particular exchange, um, we think a lot about Morocco's relations with the U.S. And, um, you know, as Matt's presentation just got into great detail on, there's a lot of really rich history there. I'm curious, um, you know, how each of you see Morocco's relations or maybe emphasis on its relations with um, African countries as well as China, um, has ha how those have maybe evolved, uh, especially in recent years, and whether you see the U.S.-Moroccan relationship as maybe being um, not as important as it once was relatively, um, or if it's just um, that there are new relations coming up alongside it and sort of how you, how you think the U.S.-Moroccan relationship um, compares now to the relations that Morocco is working on with some other parts of the world. Um, is this question addressed to me? Right. Well, thank you. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I, there's so much that I, uh, you know, uh, listen to um, that, that I want to interact with. Yes, I would like to begin with, with Moroccan US and then move on to uh, Morocco, Africa, China. I, I I'm one. sorry to interrupt you before you start. Could you please use your headphones just so we can get clearer sound? Um, okay. If that's possible. Thank you. Uh, 
Can you hear me now? Better? Good. Yes, um, better. Okay, well, uh, right now I'm here working on a, um, a transnational history, documented history of US and Morocco. And I look at the 19th century consular dispatches. That's part of the, the, the archives of looking. And, you know, there are like 27 volumes of, of archives of, of dispatches of uh, various consuls from the very late 18th century to uh, 1905, 1906. And the details are, are, are very, very interesting. There are ups and downs, I agree with, with my colleague, that there are ups and downs in, in relations. But, uh, you know, the, the, the common motif in US relations vis-a-vis -vis Morocco was to maintain those peaceful relations and to maintain that uh, Morocco remains um, a friend and a lie, well, not a lie, a friend in the region to avoid all trouble for American shipping. But the policy was defined by the Monroe Doctrine, and there's no, no, no doubt about that. In all, all significant moments where um, US uh, interventions or support was requested, uh, the United States, um, you know, wavered a little bit. Um, we're talking mostly about mid uh, 19th century, the the uh, French uh, war against Morocco, the the Battle of Isli, and uh, French demands on Morocco, and then later on uh, the, the the war between Morocco and Spain, the the war of Africa, as they call it in Spain, the war of Tetuan in Morocco, and at the same time when when the Spanish were making those uh, excessive demands, uh, the U.S. simply turned its back. So, you know, these are some of the moments where, although they were conscious and aware of what was going on, uh, they did not actually um, support Moroccan positions or, 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 or demands. Um, but, Morocco, but the US has always, or even in the 19th century, uh, taken a, 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 you know, a distance from the European imperial interest in Morocco. And um, the United States did not recognize um, European, French, Spanish um, annexation, occupation of Morocco, and wanted its rights to remain, um, you know, and, and affected by those treaties. Um, and, and so they would always argue that uh, we have a treaty with the Sultan of, of Morocco, uh, 1786, renewed in 1836, 50 years after that, and, and it, it is maintained. And uh, so we will keep to those rights, to those privileges that we have uh, by virtue of the treaties we signed. And um, it, after World War uh, II, uh, they were requested to become as a part of the, you know, the, the, you know, the countries that, you know, manage the international zone of Tangier, but they uh, again showed uh, reluctance to that, and they wanted to uh, keep those privileges. And actually, they went to the, the to the international court with France about the rights of American uh, citizens in Morocco. Um, but in 1943, and I, I, I just want to do this very quickly, in 1943, I think it was an extraordinary, I wrote a piece about it, an article about U.S.-Moroccan relations in 1943, and uh, um, I think um, Roosevelt, uh, FDR, uh, had a very uh, staunch and powerful um, position vis-a-vis -vis Morocco, and that was not um, supported by his um, cabinet, but especially by the Secretary of State, and there were, you know, all sorts of discussions going on, and, 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 and but, you know, um, definitely from the archives there, there have been, uh, you know, repeated um, uh, statement by the by uh, President Roosevelt that uh, he wanted to see this country free one day and that the Moroccan people would enjoy uh, their freedoms and, and, and uh, free themselves from the, uh, from the French. Um, um, then in the years that followed, yeah, there were um, American support for Moroccan um, attempts to, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, like maintain its sovereignty over the southern provinces of Morocco was tacit, and it, we have to look at the archives, some of it uh, declassified today. Um, it was secret, but though the the uh, you know, the statement that we'd made in public were not uh, always um, very strong. 
And today, with, uh, with the American recognitions of a Moroccan uh, uh, sovereignty over the southern provinces, I think that position has become very clear. And Biden's administration has not retracted from that position. So uh, there is nothing else to say. I mean, the King's speech uh, a couple of days ago uh, uh, emphasized this fact. And um, I think we are making uh, huge progress in, in that direction with the increasing support of other countries from Africa, from Latin America, from the Arab world uh, uh, in, in, this, in this matter. And one point that my colleague also uh, mentioned that this is, uh, this, this is a part of history that is very badly misunderstood uh, or badly understood, uh, uh, not only in Morocco, but also in, in, in Western media, official circles, and the, the, the kind of literature that we have. Now, I look at um, all the books that were written about the, the, the conflict of, of Sahara, and most of them are biased, and they have um, a little grip on the facts on the ground, and they are driven by their, you know, um, empathies and sympathies for the uh, abysmal conditions in which you know the refugees live in Tindouf and I understand that but uh, if, if you were write, writing an academic book I think you have to keep your emotions and sentiments uh, at a distance and, and look at the facts on the ground this is a country that was split in in different parts and was taken piecemeal by colonial powers in the late 19th century starting from the wars I mentioned earlier but particularly after the Berlin conference 1884 and 1885 uh, the, the entire of African continent actually was split between uh, European countries. And in the, the case of Morocco, because of its strategic location, uh, everyone wants a piece of it. And so uh, the Spain took the, the northern part. France has always uh, had always uh, in the 19th century since it occupied Algeria, uh, wanted to annex this part of the country. And, you know, I can tell you how many conferences and, you know, um, communication went on between different consuls and, and, uh, and ministers in, in Tangier and their uh, governments in Europe to see how they can uh, gain influence in this country. Uh, but it, when the time comes, you know, the Berlin conferences, there was no discussion about it. You know, think of, for example, that the Spanish wanted, uh, because of, uh, of, of, of colony they had back in the 15th century, they wanted to take it back and they had trouble finding it or locating it on the map. So they wanted Agadir at some point. Uh, the other European powers did not uh, concede to that. And so eventually they settled on Ifni, Sidi Ifni. And um, also about this time, uh, the Europeans and lots of British, French, Spanish merchants begin to uh, um, you know, reconnect from the south of, of Morocco. And because of the, the, the government at that time was so weak and it did not have full um, you know, power to control all of its um, you know, regions, uh, the Europeans uh, more and more um, seem to interfere in those. And that they wanted established illegal trade with the southern provinces, the Sous and the, the southern Sahara. And it, it took a lot of efforts to uh, persuade the Europeans uh, to, uh, you know, um, uh, abstain from doing that. Again, the archives are massive. Uh, but in the end, in the end, the Spanish and the French got together and they split the Sahara between them. The French took Mauritania and uh, the Spanish took the Southern Sahara. So that's part of the history that is never brought into discussions because either uh, obsolete to some, it's, it's like a, the past, nobody wants to go back to the past, or because it, 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 you know, it serves the interest of someone to just uh, celebrate a certain you know, um, advance a certain position and, and defend it, whatever um, that uh, um, requires. So, I, I mean, that's a, a long winded <laughs> note to uh, the, the question of, of uh, American and the, the, the primordial question for Morocco and for Moroccan foreign policy since, uh, since independence. So that's the, the Moroccan sovereignty over these southern provinces. And, um, uh, Matt uh, wrote an excellent book on, on you know, cooptation and, uh, and, and Mauritania, uh, 
and Morocco. And, and yes, I mean, the facts these days that it has been brought into the media, Morocco's claimed over Mauritania, that's, that's a fact that there were, um, and it went on until, uh, until the early 60s and Morocco recognized Mauritania in, I don't know, 1969, uh, Matt would, would uh, correct me in this, but uh, uh, Mauritania was always uh, claimed as a part of Morocco uh, until uh, many years after independence. So, you know, um, that, uh, you know, starting from 1975, when uh, Morocco organized the Green March, um, that's an, a new chapter in the struggle over, over the legitimacy of Moroccan claims over Sahara. Uh, again, the archives are massive and we have to look at various national archives, European archives, Spanish, Morocco, Mauritania, Algeria, France, um, and, Yes, U.S. did not support uh, Moroccan position vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Mauritania. It didn't strongly support Morocco uh, in the in the struggle between uh, you know Morocco and the Polisario, backed by Gaddafi and and Algeria, uh, and then many other countries from Latin America, Cuba, and others, and the Soviet Union, obviously. So it was a was a difficult decade in the 70s and the, the, the Mauritanian withdrawal because this was a territory you know, one of the one of the argument is like if Morocco's legitimacy is unquestionable why did he have to split it between or, or or at least share it with Mauritania at some point well because this was you know this initially was one region it was all part of Morocco and since Morocco had to acknowledge the independence of Mauritania then they had to settle to an agreement this was still disputed between both countries and they agreed to the Morocco to uh, um, annex two thirds of, of that territory and the Mauritanian uh, annex one third of the, the northern part of, the, of their um, um, Sahara border. Am I taking too long in this? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to um, try to move us along a little bit because yes, I do want to yeah. make sure we have time for sure. questions from the audience members absolutely, as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but thank you so much for that answer. I think, you know, between um, Matt's presentation and your remarks now, we have a really rich picture of, um, you know, the ways that historical division of, um, you know, the pre-colonial uh, Kingdom of Morocco have continued to reverberate in foreign policy up to today. Um, and so that's, you know, that historical legacy is really important, obviously, um, and something that I think, um, you know, underpins not only Morocco's relationship with the U.S., um, but also its relationship, obviously, with Europe, um, as well as with the, you know, neighboring African countries. Um, I do want to turn back to the question I asked before and maybe see if Matt wants to weigh in at all on, you know, his thoughts about the comparison between the U.S.-Moroccan relationship that he spent so much time studying um, and Morocco's relations with some other um, other countries and parts of the world. Matt, I think you're muted. Sorry. Yeah. I put in my, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, so in terms of relations with Africa, uh, I want to talk about that, but before that, I did want to mention something that Karim brought up, which was so important. So this point about the U.S. recognition of Morocco sovereignty over the Moroccan Sahara obviously is, is a huge development in the relationships between the two countries. But still, the, the Americans still have work to do on that, on, that, on that area. I mean, it's now been two years since the agreement, and we still don't have a physical consulate based in Dakhla. In countries like Haiti and Suriname, now these very mighty players in international politics have a consulate in Dakhla, but still the United States has work to do in terms of, of finalizing and finishing that agreement. So that's cer certainly something to work on. But in terms of uh, 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 Moroccan relations with sub-Saharan African countries, I mean, I think there are multiple different things going on here. The first of which is that Morocco has an extreme amount of, of economic investment in many sub-Saharan African countries. I think Al Tijara Wafa Bank is now the largest bank uh, in all of West Africa. There's a huge uh, community of Moroccans that live in Cote d'Ivoire, and that's a very important uh, like source of economic investment. But I also think there's a moral side to this, that you know, even in 1960, when Morocco first sent peacekeepers to the Congo, Mohamed al-Khami said, he said this in a speech, he said, look, if Morocco has stability, then we should help other countries in Africa. If we have our own stability, that this is something that we should help uh, other countries with on the on the continent. That's just something intrinsically important to the kings of Morocco, and it has been for for many many years. 
But I also think obviously the Morocco has strategic interests in having good relationships with these countries. I mean, what we have now is we have the American official recognition of the Moroccan Sahara as being Moroccan. Most recently we had the Spanish basically say de facto that they were gonna recognize that as well. And historically the Spanish have been the greatest opponents to that. Uh, but the next, the next step is really UN recognition and African Union recognition. And I think there's a sense that, you know, uh, if, it, you know if, if Morocco does goodwill and is a good citizen on the African continent, then maybe other African continent countries will eventually come around and realize that, that Morocco's claims over the sovereignty of the Moroccan Sahara are, are, are beneficial to everyone. So I really think uh, that's an, an important side of, of, of the discussion as well. And also, I think it has something to do with the relationship with the United States. Uh, Morocco's relationship with African countries uh, is related to its relationship with the United States. In 1960, when Morocco sent peacekeepers for the first time into the Congo, and subsequently there are 14 other uh, peacekeeper missions, those 800 Moroccan soldiers flew on American planes. They were American planes that were fl flown out of the air bases based in Morocco. So oftentimes the United States doesn't want to commit resources and soldiers to maintaining peace and security in Sub-Saharan Africa, and Morocco cooperates with it uh, in order to do that because it's in the interest of both countries. So anyway, that's, that's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna ask one more question. And in the meantime, I'm gonna ask our participants um, if they'd like to start posing questions in the, the Q&A um, or um, Miriam, I don't know if we have questions coming off Facebook, maybe you can um, gather those as well. Um, so please, I would encourage you to send those in and we'll get to those really soon. Um, my last question uh, for both of the panelists, and I would encourage you to keep your answers brief, um, just so we have time to get to the audience is, um, how do you think, if at all, um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, and, you know, some of the um, border restrictions and logistical complications that came about um, related to that have affected Moroccan diplomacy and how Morocco relates to other nations. It has, does it, has it had any effect? Is there any kind of change as a result of the pandemic that you've seen um, or that, that you feel is noteworthy? Um, well, the direct answer to that, I think, is no. Uh, Morocco has, again, shown that um, in crises like this, um, that they, they have a strong central government and they have all the logistics to manage the question directly, but also to uh, provide support within their limits um, to friendly countries. And that, that happened actually to a number of sub-Saharan countries. And um, overall, I think Morocco has done quite well and, uh, and seemed to have... Um, gained more than than lost um, from the COVID, you know. Yeah. So that's the short answer to the question. <laughs> I'm trying to be brief. Yeah. yeah. Matt, I don't know. But if you, if, if, if you allowed me to go back to Morocco and Africa, if that's all right, very briefly. Oh, sure. um, yeah. Well, Morocco rejoined the African Union in 1917. Sorry, to, to, to 2017. And that was a big deal. After 33 years of absence from uh, from that uh, organism, and uh, I think um, with that uh, it has been able to uh, capitalize and and gain a lot of support uh, on the question of Sahara, and also in terms of economy that um, it has as uh, underlined. So uh, I think uh, there's a, a shift in foreign mark, um, not just a transition, but a, a remarkable shift from 2007. Now, of course, it was preceded by a lot of work on the part of the, the king and the and the, the governments, the successive governments. So my, I think at least from two, 2013, that they have, you know, the king, you know, made several visits to African countries and signed a lot of important agreements of investment, you know, agriculture, banking, all that. So, uh, and and the COVID, just um, in the COVID period, this, um, you know, showed that Morocco can play a good role in, in overall um, maintaining strong relations between African countries and the sense of unity uh, before this crisis. And Morocco has also uh, uh, spoken loudly for the African cause, for African unity, and co constantly uh, pointed out to the importance of uh, working together to create, um, you know, viable conditions for, for the next generations. Um, Matt, do you want to jump in at all? Sure. In terms of COVID, uh, I wasn't in Morocco, obviously, when it was happening, so it wasn't. It was hard for me to. I didn't directly observe things on the ground, but I will say that my from talking to my Moroccan colleagues and friends, 
I mean, the response, I mean, dealing with COVID for any country is very difficult, right? There are ups and downs. But what I heard is that Morocco is really a model in some ways for how developing countries were able to deal with it. I mean, from what I understand, the prime minister basically had a kind of closed door meeting with a lot of the, the captains of industry in Morocco that were ahead of manufacturing and said, hey, guys, we need to get together uh, and build all this PPE, the masks and the gowns and everything else really fast. And in some ways, I mean, at least my friends were telling me that masks were available on Moroccan in the Moroccan Hadoot for one or two dirhams way faster. I mean, in the United States, we were so scrambling for them. We were so searching for masks. Like they hadn't even implemented the Defense Production Act yet in order to get it started. And, and, and by, by that time, Morocco, it was already widely available. So I think in some ways, like in terms of diplomacy, Morocco really, I think that Morocco even exported some, some of those materials to the United States as kind of a gift and other countries as well. That Morocco really actually showed that it uh, is, has a very uh, you know, advanced internal organization vis-a-vis -vis other developing countries during, during that period. Um, so we do have, uh, okay, we have a couple questions from the audience now. Um, I'm going to start with one that's um, pretty straightforward, I, I think, um, which is what is the position of the USA about Septa and Melilla? Um, if one of you uh, wants to take that on. Um, I, I really don't know. I mean, uh, what I what we can hear that this is never brought, I think, um, in any official meeting, at least nothing has uh, transpired from those possible meetings about this question. Uh, the European Union maintains a strong position um, in support of Spain. And so that's a question that has been delayed until the proper times, but Morocco has never uh, you know, withdrawn from uh, claiming that this territory is a part of, of, of his, of his um, country, of his nation. And, and um, I think he keeps referring to this with, in all sort of bilateral meetings with Spain. And the Moroccan people, public are, are, are um, always insisting on the importance of beginning those conversations about the return of this country, these uh, two cities. I need to, uh, in terms of Septa and Melilla question, I need to really look at the archives to be able to answer that question concretely. And there are like, archives on that in the Eisenhower Library in particular. And I actually have a grant to go back there and I'm going to, going to investigate it further. But the only thing that really comes to mind is that the, in the early 2000s during uh, the Bush administration, the second Bush administration, George W. Bush, there was a conflict between Morocco and Spain in which Moroccan troops, I think, occupied one of the islands, not either Septa or Melilla, but one of the islands that Spain controls Persia. in Morocco. Yeah. Yes, Persia. And uh, and uh, this, uh, so there was there was it was a bloodless conflict. The Spanish uh, authorities removed the Moroccan troops, uh, and the United States, I know, Colin Powell at the time was the Secretary of State, and he was basically like, "No, we don't want any conflict over this. These are two of our closest allies." Like Spain, Spain is a NATO country, obviously. Morocco had recently become what's called a non-NATO ally, which means that you're just almost at the, the status of ally, like South Korea and Australia and Japan are non-NATO allies. So Morocco has the same treaty status in terms of military cooperation as Australia does, for example. So the last thing that, that the United States wants is any kind of conflict between the two countries. And you know, we hope over the long term that they can figure out a, a good solution for both parties to the Septa and Melilla problem. Thank you. Um, okay, we have another question from the audience that I'll read out. Um, so Mohammed says, uh, there's a narrative that claims the Western Sahara region is one of the last colonies in the world. This claim has been furthered by one of America's most cited intellectuals, Noam Chomsky. Since it was part of Morocco's territory before its fall to colonial rule, to what extent is this issue defining Morocco's and US relations now? Um, and what are some of the tactics that Morocco could employ um, to win its claim over it internationally? Well, I think we, we partly answered that question. Um, Morocco, uh, US official position now is that they recognize this part as, as part of the, the entire country. So there's no question about that. Unless something else happens, which I don't expect, uh, then we can talk about it. But um, as, as Matt was saying, um, there's not much enthusiasm as Morocco would love to see from the, the, the current administration. 
Um, and I think the Secretary of State at some point pointed out that, um, you know, the uh, autonomy plan is one potential one, he says, one potential uh, solution to the problem. And that, of course, is, is, <laughs> is a mysterious answer to, you know, when you compare it with the official position of the, of, of the you know, of the White House. Um, I, I think Morocco takes that very seriously and uh, continues to exert pressure, um, um, reach out to all, all friends and allies, and even uh, opponents sometimes to Algeria, for example, and Mor Morocco's appeal to Algeria to just you know, turn this page and, and start a new chapter in, in bilateral history shows that Morocco takes this question very seriously and will never you know, um, a, you know, a waver in, in maintaining the sovereignty of the country. I mean, I think, I think, as Karim said, I think we kind of addressed this question earlier, but I think one of the best things that the, uh, that the Moroccan government can do is really explain to the international community, the United States, other partners, how much the Moroccan Sahara has developed uh, under the, this period of, of, uh, of interaction. I mean, there was really, before, there's really almost nothing, right? There were no airports, no roads, nothing. And it's really has, has become a much higher quality of life for the residents of that region that existed previously. And also really to compare it implicitly, the implicit comparison uh, is with Mauritania and with Mali, because these were other territories that, you know, after immediately the colonial period that during, during the pre-colonial period, these were parts of Morocco, right? And can we say today that life is better in Mauritania, you know, that has a military coup over five or 10 years or, or in Northern Mali, right? In Timbuktu, which Northern Mali is, is kind of a war zone at this point, is life better, in those areas than in the Moroccan Sahara? And it, I think the question is obviously, I mean, I think we know the answer to that question, basically. Thank you. Um, okay, we have one final question from the audience. And then I think after that, we'll probably wrap up. Um, so this question is from Yusuf. He asks, uh, does the United States have economic interests in partnering with Morocco? For instance, consider the Moroccan Gateway to Africa initiative. Does the US see Morocco as an important ally for building economic partnerships with Africa and competing with China? Well, I think, yes. Um, the recent summit um, that they had in Marrakesh just pointed out that Morocco is want to play uh, a role in um, bringing investment to Morocco, obviously, uh, but also to Africa. And uh, there are important um, projects like the, the, the Nigeria-Morocco pipeline, that um, show that Morocco wants to uh, consolidate that sort of uh, collaboration with countries like the United States, with super countries like the state, uh, United States and China. Yeah. I think there are always, there's always potential for cooperation between the United States and Morocco in the area of the economy. Uh, the kind of the biggest development was in 2004 the free trade agreement between Morocco and the United States. My sense is that most scholars have concluded that that did not benefit the two countries that much, that in terms of actual economic uh, trade benefit from it, it has not been, that, uh, not been that profitable for either country. But I think in part that just has to do with the geographic distance uh, to, to Spain and the historical relationship with France, obviously. And now we see that Spain has become actually the primary trade partner of Morocco, even over, over France. And so I think in, in many ways, it is more logical probably for the Moroccan government to develop those trade relations with Spain, just given, given the proximity between the two countries. Great. Um, thank you both so much uh, for all of your responses. I think this was a really, really rich uh, set of presentations and discussions. Um, I certainly learned a lot and I'm looking forward to reading more about uh, both of your research um, and learning more about the history of uh, U.S.-Moroccan relations um, underpinning the, the current diplomatic initiatives between the two countries. Um, I want to thank uh, Medium for organizing um, and thank uh, Karim and Matt for joining us, um, as well as our audience members. Um, and I'll hand it back to Medium in case she has any final remarks uh, before we sign off. Thank you very much. So thank you all for participating in our webinar. It has been very interesting and very enriching to listen to all of your expert insights on the topic. It has definitely been interesting to watch Morocco's uh, diplomatic approach change over the recent years. So this has brought a new uh, perspective into what um, motivated Morocco's decisions in the recent years. So thank you also to our attendees 
Um, and we hope to see you all on our next webinar. Thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.